Virtually every civilization in recorded history has revered the aggressive spirit of the warrior in battle. In the United States military, the newest members of the warrior tradition are the U.S. Navy SEALs. The modern SEAL is a product of 50 years of ocean and freshwater battlefields. Along with their special boat units, SEALs operate in near total secrecy from public view and are among the most respected and feared special forces in the world. For the first time, outside cameras were permitted to document SEAL training and field operations throughout the world. Despite some restrictions, the events pictured here are accurate representations of present-day SEAL training and military capabilities. With over 144 sovereign countries accessible from sea, the U.S. Navy SEALs are designed to be a part of a silent option for U.S. foreign policy as the 21st century approaches. The SEAL name is derived from their capacity to operate at sea, in the air, and on land. But it is their ability to work underwater that separates SEALs from any other military unit in the world. Their experience with the unforgiving and unpredictable ocean shapes their identity and is the basis for their first rule of combat. The most efficient movement is the silent one. A SEAL uh, is on it, in it, under it, one foot in and one foot out, right in the middle of the surf zone, in the worst of all conditions, in the dark, in the cold. And uh, it's a tough operational environment. But the idea is to, to come from sea and, and to get back to sea. And that's very difficult to do. When every SEAL gets in trouble, he goes to the water. And that's the thing that sets us apart. And if we can get in the water, then we feel we have an advantage. The SEALs were created in 1962, descendants of the famous underwater demolition teams of Korea and World War II. Vietnam was their first action. This war was to be fought using traditional military tactics, which called for superiority in numbers and equipment to ensure victory. Although this conventional approach ultimately failed on the battlefield, Vietnam became a watershed for modern special operations thinking. With never more than 300 men in Vietnam at any one time, SEALs were brutally effective in adapting themselves to the situation. During Vietnam, they used to be called the men with green faces because uh, according to the Viet Cong, they seemed to rise out of the ground out of nowhere with green camouflage paint to kill off a uh, VC. They were as terrifying as the VC were. In fact, it was the one war where the U.S. government fought fire with fire sitting six or eight hours in the water uh, on a canal waiting for some VC to come driving by in his sandpan so you could grease him. Uh, that got old in a hurry. And for, it's for two reasons. One, it, it's not a lot of fun sitting in the water six to eight hours. And two, uh, you weren't always sure who you were shooting. The legacy of Vietnam uh, was a lot of people saw us as just that, hunters and, and killers. And because that's what we did. I mean, that's what we were paid to do. Although, to be quite honest, the most successful Vietnam operations didn't involve killing at all, it involved capturing. But killing was part of it, I mean, you can't get around it. We kept adapting, and in a sense, I guess you could say uh, that we did become uh, a lot more like the VC than the VC themselves, and I think that's one of the reasons why we were so damn successful over there. The 
The ideal SEAL strategy is to win without fighting a pitched battle, accomplishing the most destruction with a minimal amount of effort. Their attack relies on intense violence and the impact of shock force to create a temporary appearance of superior strength. In any fight, it is essential that they first stun their target with an all-out fury, then quickly fade away in the confusion. At critical moments in combat, men must overcome conditions and misery they could never have imagined. For SEALs operating far from the protection of the main force, the difference between living and dying is measured in seconds. In this particular maneuver, called a center peel, a SEAL squad uses live ammunition while practicing a coordinated move-and-shoot maneuver. Despite the appearance of overwhelming firepower, an eight-man squad's rate of fire is limited by the amount of ammunition they carry, often not more than 4,000 rounds. SEALs are not main force units. We don't uh, have civil action teams. We can't come in and build churches and paint schools and do all those kind of things around the orphanages and stuff. Usually when they send us, it's a hot target and we're there to take it out. Take them, Tracy! We'll stay within the confines of humanity, uh, hopefully. But it's a dirty business and uh, the three things come into play. We have to be decisive, we have to be aggressive, and most importantly, we have to be ruthless. There's just not enough of us normally, and when we get there, we have to take care of business. If we're gonna be described as bad dudes, we certainly can uh, live up to that reputation in a tactical sense. We're highly trained, extremely aggressive, extremely bright young men, absolutely fearless in a tactical sense and uh, if that's the definition of a bad dude they certainly fall within that definition before vietnam and in the immediate years following conventional military wisdom held that special operations forces could never affect the outcome of any conflict this belief has been reassessed however in the face of two historical occurrences the rise of international terrorism and the military collapse of the Soviet Union. As the emerging pattern of smaller localized world conflicts brought a timeliness for their unconventional methods, SEALs have continued their training in sabotage and surprise precision attacks, which sometimes could include civilian targets. It is a different duty, but I, I think it's a necessary one. That, you know, some jobs are dirty and you need the dirty individuals to do the dirty job and that's pretty much what SEALs are. The jobs that no one wants, we're gonna get. I suppose there are those that are the brain dead ones that go strictly by the book, and that's the way I would put it. The book is a guide. The book is there, it's kind of like the Bible. It's interpreted. You, you interpret the book and, uh, and apply it in the, uh, the best way you see fit. It's a good guide, and uh, I'm certainly not a by the book man. Some issues I am when it comes to discipline, accountability, things of that nature. Few forces in the world have the training to resist a SEAL surprise attack. Compact in size and heavily armed, a 16-man SEAL platoon will attack under any circumstances and can project a killing power far in excess of its physical size. In a matter of minutes, these specially trained forces can overcome an objective with aggressive techniques like fast roping, 
landing onto their target ready to shoot in seconds. SEAL training and preparation enabled them to be ready for the missions they were assigned in the Gulf War. In Operation Desert Storm, the Naval Special Warfare Units in country numbered less than 300 people. Only 60 were SEALs. During the Gulf War, the SEALs performed many different tasks, such as detonating floating mines and inspecting shipping in the Persian Gulf. But their primary mission was to scout the beaches of Kuwait, charting them for possible invasion routes, for an invasion that ultimately never happened. We haven't had an amphibious operation, a major one, since Inchon during the Korean War. We didn't in the Persian Gulf. So the SEALs' operation there was to launch a, a feint maneuver, to pretend that there were Marines landing on the coast of Kuwait when there really wasn't. In a bold feint to the Iraqi right flank, six SEALs swam 500 yards onto a Kuwaiti beach in the early hours of D-Day for Desert Storm. Hiding in the shallow surf, they rigged a series of explosives which went off on a staggered timeline, creating the impression that an amphibious invasion was underway. This diversion succeeded in tying up a division of Iraqi soldiers. Another Gulf War victory was achieved when a four-man SEAL element captured a strongly fortified oil rig occupied by 23 Iraqi soldiers. Notwithstanding their success in working alongside main force units, the SEAL's strength remains in their ability to act independently. Unlike conventional troops who are trained to bring massive firepower onto a target, often indiscriminately, SEALs avoid any killing which might compromise the safety of their small force and jeopardize the success of their mission. This is Predator standing by for extraction. I mark you identify, over. There is no glamour or mystery about preparing for war. For SEALs, it's a work ethic. Platoon life is built around maintaining a high state of readiness. The SEALs know that the winners in wartime are the ones most prepared to react. They know we're a pretty high speed bunch and we're at risk a lot. We go in harm's way a lot. Hell, our daily routine is harm's way for that matter. When you're practicing, when you're training, some people crowd the lower end of the margins. They stay down to 25, 30 percent. I think we ought to be training up here 90 to 100 percent, really hanging it out as far as we can hang it out without getting it cut off, so to speak. Because when you go into combat, it goes to 150 percent straight away, and you can't really train for that. You can only train close to it. Every military unit is rated for its strategic value to the overall battlefield strategy. One advantage for SEAL units is their proficiency in reaching a destination quickly and undetected. SEAL teams employ a wide selection of different weapons designed to maximize their value of mobility and small size. This is the Desert Patrol Vehicle, or DPV, used for traveling long distances on the ground. Designed to be airlifted to a forward staging area and then driven to its target, the DPV carries heavy weapons and drives with the speed and durability of a Baja racing car. The cars carry a crew of three men each, and in the side basket, either a passenger or extra fuel bladders to increase range. These special fuel bladders, along with the racing tires, are self-sealing and can withstand a direct hit by a 50 caliber round without deflating or exploding. With an extended range of 600 miles on the ground, 
the desert patrol vehicles can remain camouflaged and hidden deep inside enemy territory to report back on enemy troop movements or provide fire support for raids on small fixed targets. What we try to do is drive the car as easy as we possibly can, getting to the target and from the target. So if something happens and we do have to use the full extent of the car's capabilities, then we have a lot of car left over. If we were to drive it hard and to the you know, wide open everywhere we went, then we'd use up the car before we got the target and there's a chance we may not be able to get back. So we just cruise as easy as we possibly can, making good time, of course, but when it comes time to put the hammer down, we got a fresh car, we can go like hell. What we have here is a passenger seat, or the navigator seat as we call it, and he has his choice of weapons he can take with him depending on the mission. This here is a Mark 19, which is a 40 millimeter grenade launcher, and we normally carry about 200 rounds for the lower gun here when we're using a Mark 19. The top weapon here is a 50 cal machine gun. This weapon here shoots a 50 caliber bullet, and that's more of our long range weapon. And that one will really reach out there and, and touch them. And as you can see, we have a lot of firepower, much more than just 10 or 15 SEALs can carry in. When you start talking 50 cal and Mark 19, you're laying down a lot of firepower. Cease fire! And it's pretty impressive when you see these guns go off on this thing. Traveling over the water's surface remains the most efficient and effective maritime method to take SEALs to and from their target. These high-speed boats, called HSBs, are one of several different sized vessels operated by the SEAL's special boat units. The HSB carries a crew of three and can carry a SEAL squad and their equipment long distances at sustained speeds of 70 miles per hour. Powerful open water racing boats they can be transported by ship or plane closer to the target, increasing operational range. As SEAL teams move through water, the problems of dehydration, cold, underwater navigation, and avoiding detection multiply in difficulty as the distances increase. Swimming to and from a target becomes a mixture of planning, attitude, physical conditioning, and luck. The submarine is essential for getting SEALs to destinations throughout the world. These submarines are equipped to carry the dry deck shelter, a special underwater housing attached to the hull. The DDS contains the SEALs' Zodiac rafts, or their larger mini-submarines, known as swimmer delivery vehicles or SDVs. Launching seals from a submarine, commonly referred to as locking out, is a time-consuming and complex undertaking. A difficult task under good conditions, performing this job at night and in cold water requires an emotional patience beyond the ordinary. In the North Atlantic, for example, it's freezing cold, you're making the transition from a very cold, wet environment to a dry, cold environment. That in and of itself can take your life in a very short period of time. Should you, your suit become penetrated or your gear gets wet, you can't stay dry, you're, uh, you're, you're in trouble. You're in real serious trouble. Launching a swimmer delivery vehicle to the target could require seals to remain underwater for hours. Every drop in degree of water temperature corresponds to a rise in degree of difficulty for survival. Wearing bulky dry suits and 50 pounds of extra insulation affects every movement. Simple communication between teammates becomes difficult. Of all the SEAL weapons and tactics, the SDV is the hardest for enemies to defend against top secret as to its technical capabilities. This mini submarine can carry explosives into a harbor or inland waterway, positioning them to be detonated at any given time. Despite the demands of SDV operations, the swimmer delivery vehicle remains the most important and potent offensive capability the SEALs have.
A typical SEAL platoon on a land warfare mission will carry four M60 light machine guns. The other men will arm themselves with either M14 rifles or AR-15 carbines mounted with a 40 millimeter grenade launcher. This grenade launcher can destroy machine gun nests, enemy vehicles, and saturate the target with high explosive rounds that send fragments flying at 3,000 feet per second. Taken in combination, the armament and initial firepower of a SEAL platoon equals that of a 100-man company of regular infantry. This is the M60 E3 light machine gun. It's a belt-fed, gas-operated, air-cooled, fully automatic weapon that fires at 550 rounds per minute. A Navy SEAL handles this weapon by himself and can carry anywhere between 400 and 1,000 rounds. Normally on patrol with this weapon, it's held low at the hip. But when you have to fire it, you bring it right up and fire it from the shoulder. You'll see a lot of guys in Hollywood movies holding it down at the hip, kind of just leaning back and shooting it. It doesn't work that way. The weapon can be accurately employed as a rifle just by firing it from the shoulder. There isn't any other special forces units that carries a major caliber weapon like this and employs it in such a fashion. There are a lot of stories of these weapons firing into the thousands of rounds without the barrels being changed, turning white hot so you can actually see the projectiles traveling down the bore, wearing out the rifling, but the weapon keeps on firing and the enemy just keeps on dying. And that's why we basically carry this weapon, to destroy the enemy, to lay down an incredible hail of lead that's necessary to terminate our foes. The SEAL trademark is to strike a target in merciless fashion. The ambush of an unsuspecting opponent may appear cold-blooded to some, but its purpose is not just to destroy, but to demoralize an opponent. For the SEAL, how, when, and where he kills his enemy is often as important as the actual destruction of the target itself. It's like the samurai. If the guy aspires to be a SEAL, he's aspiring to be something like a samurai. Discipline and control. Not some lethal weapon that we unleash like a Rambo. It's teamwork. Our next weapon is the Macmillan Model M88 50 caliber sniper rifle. This weapon here fires the same 50 caliber cartridge used in the Browning M2 heavy machine gun. This weapon here is accurate on hard targets in excess of 2,000 yards, and that's the way the weapon is most likely employed. We can take out aircraft parked on a runway. We can take out a generator. We can take out the engine block of a vehicle with this weapon here firing a high-explosive, armor-piercing incendiary projectile. The range and power of the Macmillan M88 was used by SEAL sniper teams in Somalia to successfully cover UN forces and prevent casualties. Rounds were falling all over the outside of our bunker, but we couldn't catch the individuals who were doing it. They would pop up on a rooftop, fire at us, and then disappear. And that was getting, well, frankly, pretty annoying. So when we saw a guy actually on the sights getting ready to fire his weapon in our direction, we made the call, we went ahead and took the shot. I dumped him. Next guy, he opened up on us with a lightweight machine gun. We were definitely outgunned. I uh, swung my crosshairs over onto his muzzle flash, set up on it, and capped off the shot. When I came back up, his gun was spilled over the front of the sandbags and he was spilt out the backside. Uh, Somali ran across my field of view with an RPG. I took a shot at him and I got him just before he launched the RPG. I mean, he was on his knees, eyes at the sight when the round hit him. They were seven, eight hundred yards away. I couldn't see their total facial expressions, but I know they weren't happy. We're not out there to kill women and children. You don't want to do that, but you have to get the guy that's trying to kill U.S. forces. One shot, one kill. The psychological value that has, it's effective.
It has been said that in war, a man's brain turns into water and pours out his ears, and all he goes on is instinct. For every soldier, fear is an enemy. People have said they were scared. You, you can say you're scared. Now, if you say you're scared and you won't do it, then you're, you're in the wrong line of work. I think fear is good. I think each fear level that you reach, you're closer to your goal. But getting in a platoon, you need to control the fear. Because fear is good, because it keeps you smart, and it keeps you from being hurt. No SEAL has ever surrendered or been captured. No SEAL has ever been left behind by his comrades. To an operator, the only thing worse than losing is quitting. It comes from a, a, a doctrine that's been around since day one in the teams, and that doctrine is this, is that we cannot afford the luxury of a quitter. We, we can't do that. If we're out in the field and uh, we're on an actual mission and somebody says, hey, <laughs> No, I'm tired of this, I want to go home. I can't afford that. It's not part of the plan. The reality is you have a bunch of guys who just want to be really, really good at their jobs. They hate to lose. You'll see that in everything they do. I mean, you could play friggin' hopscotch and it would turn violent if Seals played it, just because one team would be losing. It pays to be a winner, just like they say in Buds. Officially called Basic Underwater Demolition Seal Training, it's better known simply as Buds an all-volunteer six-month training course that every officer and enlisted man must pass through to become a SEAL. Tougher and more difficult than most military training, for every thousand men who apply to become a SEAL, less than 15% are accepted to begin BUDS training. During the 25-week course that follows, 70% or more of the original students who begin BUDS will quit or be failed. People are sometimes shocked about what they see uh, when, it, when it comes to BUDS training. People have to understand that what we're trying to do here is we're getting an individual ready to go to war. Buds is a kick in the nuts. That's about what Buds is. Buds is an initiation. Buds is to find out if you need to be here or not need to be here. A young man, when he goes to Buds, he's got a mission. And the mission that he has is to get out of Buds. And that's a quest. The goal is to graduate from Buds and become a SEAL. Can you fulfill that difficult mission, go through all the wickets that are there, one after another after another, physically, mentally, uh, teamwork-wise? Well, the reason that we're hard on them is because the job is hard. This is nothing like what happens in the real world. So if you at all are shocked by some of the stuff that goes on or uh, how stringent some of the days are, you know, you've got to realize that where we go and the way and the places that we operate in demand more out of us than what we can provide here in training. You'll see a lot of the uh, things which may look uh, to the American public very sensational, i.e. Uh, having uh, hands and feet tied in the swimming pool or carrying logs around for uh, four hours over their heads. The sense of the whole training is to evoke from him this tremendous dedication, this great inner strength which is there and which he needs to tap and to demonstrate under extremely stressful conditions. All SEAL instruction is preparation for the actual moments of battle when fear can paralyze a man's ability to react in a combat situation. The obstacle course exposes weakness and indecision. Although this training is designed to foster competition and reward aggressiveness, every experienced SEAL operator believes that teamwork equals survival. The students who pass BUDS training will be those who remain in control and work together, no matter the conditions, no matter the fear. 
This water is so cold it shocks a man's breath away. Every man's ability to endure cold must be unquestionable. Being cold and wet makes minutes seem like hours. It can drive a person insane with misery and make him question his commitment to becoming a SEAL. Cold is probably one of the primary reasons people drop out of training, because it's an incredible demoralizer. I mean, if you're cold and wet, I mean, you just don't want to do anything. And the last thing you want to do is get any colder. If you're constantly cold and constantly wet, I mean, it really has an impact on everything you do. We're cold and wet. We work in water. And that's why we have an emphasis on that so much. But you have to function. I mean, you have to keep going. You have to keep doing what you're doing. It's easy to say I quit. But, you know, we don't quit in this business. What's your problem, Mr. Null? Why don't you want to be here? Hell Week is simulated combat scenario, and you're failing. We put you in a real situation. You're going to kill people. So you've got to put out... You've got Special to... Operations Forces are sports cars, for example. They're a real high-speed rail job, a dragster, for example. And uh, they have to be honed to a lot finer sharpness. It takes a lot to, to get a man there. If they want Porsches and dragsters in the inventory to go out and do the things that this nation needs done that cannot employ main force units, then uh, that's, they're just going to have to pay the price. During combat, you can't call timeout. You uh, can't decide that uh, things aren't quite the way you want them. There has to be absolute trust and confidence that the young men come out of there uh, are going to be able to deal with the most difficult emotional and physical stresses that they're going to be presented with in a real world mission. The preparation for close quarter battle, or CQB, reveals the SEAL philosophy in the short version. We do whatever we have to do to meet with success and to make our contribution to the effort. And whatever it takes to do that, we're going to do that. You know, the killing part may come along with it. But that's, that's how it goes. If the enemy thinks we're bad dudes, that's just great. That's what, that's what we want them to think. In a serious vein, I think that you will find uh, among the senior military leadership uh, today that most of them view us as very quiet professionals that carry tremendous capacity for a small unit. But uh, the bottom line is when they do conduct an operation are in fact bad dudes in a very tactical sense. For CQB, the SEALs use the Navy version of the MP5 submachine gun. Small and light, this weapon is employed by anti-terrorist and special reaction forces throughout the world. In the world of the terrorist, there are no rules. Anyone, everywhere is a target. In the world of counterterrorism, however, the rules never change. Fast is slow, slow is quick. Front sight focus, trigger squeeze, discipline and control. This is probably one of the most dangerous things that we have to go through. During this, each person has to be thinking on his own. Clear left. Clear right. All clear. Coming out. Primarily, what we're looking for is that guys can get into the room quickly, down their walls, uh, to where they can engage these targets here and get good kill shots high in the chest or up in the forehead area, and also identify whether they have a gun or they don't have a gun. When we enter a structure with this and we spot our adversaries, there's two ways we can take them out with this weapon. One is the double tap. A quick two shots to the center mass. If he doesn't drop, another one right to the head. So I think that a lot of people come through here and they think, well, you know, this training is fun. This is going to be great. Uh, we're going to get out in the sand and the surf and, and have a great time. But the thing that we try to emphasize here is don't lose sight of the big picture. And the big picture is, is that this is a combat unit and that someday you may be called on to use all those skills that you've been developing in an actual situation. Okay, we're going to start going live now. And that, what that means is you really have to concentrate on that muzzle discipline. We're going to slap you in the back of the ear every time we see a muzzle sweep somebody's head. I want to see slow movement. We're going live fire for the first time. Slow. Walk slow. 
The reason that we're looking for safety is this is a this goes real quick and it takes a lot of thinking. If a guy happens not to think or he's worried about other things, he may sweep a guy's head with his muzzle or his legs with a muzzle. Clear right! Clear left! All clear! All clear! Coming out! He swept his head bad. What we're looking for is to make sure he's got good muzzle discipline, that the person's head in front of him is clear before he comes down on target, and as he sweeps, he's aware enough to where he doesn't sweep into another guy's weapon or another body. Everybody ready to go? Yeah. 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 All right. Let's kill him. This is a real thinking man's game because there's so many things to think about. Think about muzzle control, target discrimination, uh, front sight focus. You want certain things to be involuntary. One thing you don't want involuntary is pulling that trigger. Pulling the trigger, it has to be something that is sure. You, you have to know when you pull that trigger because if you involuntarily pull the trigger without actually thinking, you end up shooting the wrong person. You're in a room that's no bigger than you know, what, 10 foot by 10 foot in most cases, and you got four guys in there shooting right next to you. One slip, and it's over. Parachuting might be the most dangerous insertion method employed by the SEALs. While high altitude, low opening military freefall, called a halo, is a potentially devastating means of attack. One mistake in concentration while falling through the sky at 125 miles per hour, and the moment of truth is short. One of the, the real dangers, I think, for the SEALs is their own image of themselves as uh, almost invincible. They uh, revel in doing things that uh, you would say any sane person won't do, jumping out of an airplane at. Uh, uh, 35,000 feet in the night and then not opening your parachute until you're, you're almost on the ground. What we can do is jump out at altitudes of 25,000 feet, eight or nine miles away, come in using a compass very quietly and land within 25 yards of a target with 14 or 15 people. It just gives us another capability of getting into some place where it's tight. The job is very dangerous. You're talking high altitudes, high winds, becoming lost, having malfunctions underneath your canopy. Uh, so many things can go wrong. This SEAL platoon and their two stacked Zodiac rafts, called a double duck, will use static line parachutes to be airdropped at sea from altitudes of less than 3,000 feet. Constantly preparing for war during peacetime is the ultimate challenge for SEAL leaders but overestimating capabilities can be an inherent danger for aggressive men. The last time we did a parachute type insertion in wartime or in a conflict was in Granada and we lost four SEALs. They were very aggressive. They stormed out in some pretty severe conditions and uh, they did not survive it. Some people would say probably in that case they were overly aggressive. It's not, I'm not gonna sit here, I wasn't on the ramp, I didn't make the decision. They paid the ultimate price for their uh, their aggressiveness and their decisiveness in that particular matter. The thing that really is distinctive about Grenada is that it was done very rapidly. There was a sudden call from the White House that you know, we want to go down and rescue those uh, medical students. They were prepared for a day drop into a fairly benign sea. They were dropped at night into a very uh, stormy sea. Four of the, the men drowned, and it just should never have happened. The four men who died were members of a specially trained SEAL unit assigned to the invasion. Their platoon never reached its objective of marking the airfield for an airborne invasion. Two other SEAL platoons were to rescue hostages at the governor's mansion and capture the island's only radio station. At the governor's house, enemy fire shot down two helicopters and prevented a third from landing. Once inside the mansion, this platoon was surrounded by armored vehicles and Cuban troops. One SEAL sniper was credited with 17 to 22 enemy kills during the night, which kept the Cubans from overrunning the house. Meanwhile, the second platoon successfully destroyed the radio station, but was forced to escape by swimming out to sea. 
with several of their men seriously wounded. The situation deteriorated uh, quickly in Grenada, and there was a hastily planned, hastily executed uh, operation that had problems, no doubt. Uh, there was a, a chain of command that never exercised together before, much less fought together. What we ran into was more than we expected. This tendency to accept missions outside of their capabilities reappeared in Operation Just Cause in Panama in 1989. For the SEALs, it ended in a disaster. Four men dead, eight men badly wounded. The shockwave over those casualties still echoes inside the SEAL ranks to this day. When SEALs go in harm's way and, and SEALs get hurt, as they would in any small family, Everyone feels it because everyone knows everyone else. And when something goes wrong, you want to know why. Because our business is the business of sneaking up and taking care of business and going home. Not a business of fighting anybody on a, on a lengthy scale, or definitely not in the business of dying. There were two SEAL missions in the Panama invasion. The first, to swim across the Panama Canal and destroy two enemy patrol boats. The second, to seize Patilla Airfield, where Manuel Noriega had a jet plane ready for his escape. The original plan called for a SEAL platoon to use snipers to cover the hangar. But that plan was changed, and the SEAL force grew to five times their normal operating size. Arriving at the airfield in rubber boats, the SEALs were spotted and as they approached the hangar, the hunters became the hunted. The Panamanian officer walked out in front of Noriega's hangar and said, what are you Americans doing here? And the Americans said to him, put your weapons down. And the Panamanian officer replied, you should not be running exercises here. This is very dangerous. And shortly thereafter, fire broke out. Uh, initiated by the Panamanian. The repercussions of this calamity within the SEAL community continue to fuel heated debate about the proper use of their force in the future. What you found, for example, in Panama was inter-service rivalries there getting in the way of what the best unit was to take a particular operation. And in the case of the airport at Petilia, Army Rangers take down airports, not Navy SEALs. You've got all these guys just trained right up to the edge of perfection, uh, and they want to show what they can do. It was a, a case of they had a war and everybody wanted to come. If the Special Operations Forces are at the point of the military sword, the Navy SEALs consider themselves the tip of the blade, and the tip is the most vulnerable. With only an estimated 2,500 SEAL operators, the teams ultimately rely on the individual and his dedication to win as the decisive advantage between survival and death. The fundamental missions haven't changed. Give a SEAL his pair of swim fins and his K-bar knife and uh, a weapon of some type, and he'd still be able to prosecute a mission of some level because uh, that's how we started, and we still basically are a very simple unit. We do have a lot of new technology, which has enabled us to do many more things, but uh, the essence is relying on the individual for, for the real combat effectiveness. That individuality sometimes uh, causes them to overamp in the, in the civilian sector, but you got a, you know, you got a racehorse here. They require a little, uh, little different handling. You, know, you got to rein them in a little bit more. But we don't want to rein them in so much, we take that aggressiveness out of them. The way I put it to them is, gentlemen, you can be as aggressive as you want to as long as you maintain it at a professional level. A popular misconception about the SEAL operator is one of unlimited military capability and a superhuman capacity to endure pain and hardship. Although that image is somewhat exaggerated, their ruthlessness in battle and dedication to winning has often been misunderstood. SEAL business is up close and dirty, a force that relies on secrecy and superior planning rather than firepower to engage the enemy. 
Seals are an instrument of ego and guts, fear and intelligence, never forgetting that to survive, they must remain stealthy and unpredictable. Where on the one hand, we are given a lot of credit for being creative and having a, a, a special abilities, that independence also, uh, some people will, will see that as these guys are loose cannons, they're out of control. We are very well disciplined, uh, though it expresses itself in a different way than it does in the Marine Corps or in the Army. SEALs have served in every U.S. military action since Vietnam. Under an operational designation officially described as conflict other than war, they remain active in operations that often go unreported. It is a job that requires living in secrecy and maintaining distance from the public. I'm not being paid to go hang out at the beach. I'm being trained to do a job. May not be going to war, may not ever go to war or do anything cool. Uh, again, but I mean, they're paying me that just in case it might happen. Now the minute I say, no, I'm not gonna do it, then I'm a loser. I mean, then I need to leave. I need to leave with my head down. We spend many years of our lives training and preparing for war. Hopefully there'll be peace, because any true warrior wishes for peace. But in the event of a war, we're fully dedicated to go out there and do our best job to fight it. All of us want to have a good career and do the best job we can and have the American dream just like anybody else. We're not a bunch of mindless machines bent on killing people. We do a job for America just like anybody else, just like a policeman, just like a fireman, and we're proud of it. The personal price for a career on the teams can be steep. Divorce rates among the all-male units are high. The operational backbone for this small community comes primarily from the enlisted men, not the officers. Among themselves, individual respect is earned solely on an operator's reputation as a warrior. Those who achieve this unspoken notoriety are known as meat eaters. The word killing is certainly a very negative word in our society. That word uh, certainly in the warrior caste needs to be inculcated into their mind. And you have to be at ease with that because that is the byproduct. I try to keep myself in neutral when it comes to that. I derive no pleasure nor sorrow. Just stay neutral. Move through the target and move on and carry on with your life. And don't look back, don't dwell on it. I never, never got the shakes. Have no regrets, have no regrets. I wish I'd had a few more targets to assault, to be very truthful with you. There, we give job satisfaction just like anybody else. And we're not looking for nine to five jobs here. You know, we're looking uh, for uh, uh, maybe uh, that call that's going to come in the middle of the night and say, hey, you know, come into work. It's, it's time to go do your thing. A story is told of a Bud's class standing at attention in front of a large sand berm. Suddenly, one of the SEAL instructors quietly climbed to the top of the berm. There, in full view of the class, he shielded his eyes from the sun and stared out to sea searching the entire horizon from side to side. When he finished, he walked down the hill and stood in front of the class. Does anyone know what I'm looking for? He asked. No one replied. He paused before he spoke. I'm looking for a war. <laughs>